So my secret's out. <laughs> uh, as you heard, I'm a, I'm a tech entrepreneur, and, and I've benefited greatly from uh, the rich, vast, and highly successful ecosystem of Silicon Valley. I'm also an Egyptian immigrant. I'm a refugee of war. And my family struggled uh, severely at times from uh, economic disadvantage for the first half of my life. The war was uh, Black September, a very bloody and brutal battle in Jordan in 1970. I was five at the time, and my family lived in a town called Urbid, which is on the border of Israel, and had become the hotbed of conflict between Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinians. And surviving meant escaping to underground shelter, living on food and water rations, not knowing when we'd be able to reemerge. It meant fleeing my classroom in the middle of the day while being fired on with artillery and army tanks pressing behind us. I remember walking and then running into the fields with my parents, not knowing where we were going or how long it would take to get there, just trying desperately to find shelter and not become casualties of war. Later on, when my parents immigrated to the US, we brought hope for a new life in a new country. But I quickly saw that hope turn to struggle as my parents grappled with gaining access to basic necessities to provide for us food, shelter, employment. And at the time, I remember people in our lives who well-intentioned, well-meaning people looking at us with eyes of pity and offering us charity to help us. And charity did help us at crucial moments. But what I also remember is that it chipped away at our dignity. And in me, it created feelings of shame that I didn't know how to explain to myself as a child. I often think back to that classroom and uh, the journey that brought me here. And I wonder what happened to my classmates. What I know for certain is that I had access to opportunity that allowed me to escape the ravages of war, and that this is likely the most important difference between me and them. I'm reminded of that every time that I see struggle. When I see a homeless person today, I wonder what their story is, and I wonder if lack of access played a role in their circumstance. And I'm reminded of the fine line that separates us as human beings. Now, I've come to view my adversity as a gift because it's instilled in me a deep sense of wanting to bring justice to the world. Um, justice beyond uh, Title IX rights. <laughs> One of the greatest injustices in the world is that the is that the planet's population lives on less than $2 a day. This is tragic on a human level, and it's also one of the greatest, it's an insurmountable barrier to global economic development because the bottom half, what I've come to call as the forgotten half, owns 1% of the world's assets. Now, hearing numbers like this, it's, it may sound like a developing world phenomenon, but in the US, a similar story is to be told because the bottom half owns 2.5% of the wealth, and that gap, as we continue to hear in the media between the haves and the have-nots, is growing with each day. We tend to think of poverty when we see images like this. We associate it with disease, starvation, victimization, despair. And while it's true these images betray 
a harsh and tragic reality that deserves our collective compassion and, intention, atten and attention. It's also a limited view, and it is a dangerous view. Because what you don't know about poverty, like my family, most people in poverty don't view themselves as victims. Most live functioning lives and have loving families and communities. And they don't want our pity or charity. What they want is equal access. They want fair access. The kind of access that we've come to take for granted in the economic system that we benefit from. And that access has begun with access to capital. Our access to capital has allowed us access to better education. It's given us access to better housing. It's given us access to safer neighborhoods. It's given us access to health care. But the same institutions and the system that we benefit from is not available to this half of the world because it's not deemed good business. The bottom half represents an untenable risk. In 2006, Dr. Muhammad Yunus flipped that conventional wisdom on its head. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for his pioneering work in microfinance, which, he, which had been developing over the course of 30 years. And, and we've all heard about microfinance. It's become a, a global phenomenon. Underneath the stories, what, what Dr. Yunus proved were two important things. First, that a tiny amount of money could have a disproportionate impact on the lives of the poor. And second, that they're an excellent credit risk. The birth of Kiva was inspired by Dr. Yunus and his work in microfinance. And Kiva harnessed the power of technology and built on microfinance in two important ways. By bringing the power of the internet and making microlending a global phenomenon. In the same way that the internet has democratized access to information, access to communication, Kiva's used the internet to democratize access to capital. And it also made microlending a personal experience, allowing people like us to make loans to people in the bottom half, if you will, connecting the top half to the bottom half, person to person. And what this has done is it's, it's created a different face of poverty. It's allowing us to see a face of poverty that represents hope, that represents ingenuity, that represents entrepreneurialism. And what we've come to see is rather than these, this being a population that needs our charity, we think of them now as business partners and, and the entrepreneurs that are resourceful enough to wring profit out of practically nothing. Kiva began with one borrower, Elizabeth Amala, Elizabeth was a fishmonger in Uganda, and she would sell small amounts of fish on the roadside. And she's a mother of eight, and she couldn't afford to send her children to school because she, could, she couldn't make enough profit selling the fish. She would buy fish from the middleman and then go to the roadside. And what Elizabeth wanted to do was she lacked enough money to take the bus to go to Lake Victoria, which is a few hours away, where she could buy fish directly from the fishermen. So with a Kiva loan, she was able to get the bus fare, and she also was able to buy refrigeration so that she could buy larger quantities of fish at a lower price point and start to scale her business. So one loan, one bus ride, and one refrigerator allowed Elizabeth to increase the scale of her business, increase her profits, and she was able to begin sending her children to school. And from that, many other entrepreneurs have gone on to do similar things. Now, when we think about entrepreneurs, we tend to think of people like Mark Zuckerberg or an image of Steve Jobs come to mind. And people like Elizabeth or Esther, in this case, make us realize what a limited view that is. 
Esther similarly supports a family of seven as a widow through subsistence farming. She has three dairy cows. She has a herd of goats. She sells milk. She has half an acre of land that she grows tea and coffee on. And for that, she makes about $35 a month and about $160 a year on the coffee. And Elizabeth discovered that if she had $50, she could buy a hybrid goat. And apparently, a hybrid goat is a more efficient kind of goat. <laughs> Who knew? But she figured out that if she bred her, this hybrid goat with her breed, she could grow her goats faster and increase her profits and returns. Now, I don't know about you, but that's an entrepreneur and a business plan that I could back any day. One of the first loans that I made on Kiva was uh, to a Cambodian sewing cooperative. It was $700 to buy sewing machines for members of the cooperative who had escaped the grips of human trafficking. And seeing this loan made me realize that a sewing machine represented freedom from slavery and a path towards opportunity and hope. And as you can see here, this loan was paid in full, which means that lenders like myself then had the funds to relend to other entrepreneurs. One of the most powerful things about the, the lending marketplace on Kiva is the relending effect, because 80% of the money that flows in gets relent over and over and over again. And over five years from Elizabeth, the marketplace has created a global movement of over 200 countries. And it, in that time, over half a million people have made $200 million in loans to another half a million entrepreneurs in 58 countries. And 98.5% of those loans have been repaid in full. What this really speaks to is a successful path that's being weaved through a world of dualistic extremes that we live in. When we connect with our humanity, we think of charity. When we think about making money and business, we think about profit maximization. And our relentless pursuit of profit maximization has led us into an era of hypercapitalism at a tremendous cost to society. And you've heard that in far more eloquent ways than I can express here earlier today. But in between these dualistic extremes is an opportunity to pave a middle path. And in Kiva's case, it's a path that, that draws on the principles of capitalism and business, the powerful principles there, but seeks to do that in a way that benefits society, benefits humanity, as well as creating economic good, democratized access to capital, or what we've come to call connected capital. And ultimately, what this is about is our humanity. My dream is that we all find a way to create a world where we bring our humanity to business and business to all of humanity. And that, I thought, was an idea worth sharing. Thank you.